podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Good evening and welcome to the Monday night edition of the Rangers Rabble podcast. It's that time again. We've seen this movie before. Some actors have changed, but for the main, the key cast remains the same. There are no plot twists in what are this collection of Rangers disaster movies. There are no excuses. We just simply aren't good enough. No passion, no bottle, no quality. It's been two years since John Bennett said this was the greatest Ranger squad ever assembled. And since that point, we haven't won a league title and he is conspicuous by his absence. The club demand everything from everyone. But as fans, do we get that back? We deserve better. Under the leadership of James Tavernier's captaincy, we are the ship HMS Titanic that keeps hitting the iceberg. The time for change is now. A mass clear out is needed to cleanse years of repetitive failure. Rangers should be about winning, winning multiple trophies and defending those trophies. Far too many have forgotten that. If you disagree, join us for your say by calling us on 0141 628 7237 when the lines open very shortly. Delighted to say joining me this evening are two people that never let you down. I'm joined tonight by a Scottish football guru, a Go Radio football contributor, and last minute super sub Connor. Connor, how are we? Um, a bit, a bit speechless for that intro. To be honest with you, Davey, that's. Um, I think, uh, I think Spielberg's got to be quite in his boots, surely after that. Um, no, I all good, better, better than I was uh, last night. That's for sure. So, that's that's the bonus. Um, and, I mean, I, if I'm a, a Scottish football guru, I will take that all day long. <laughs> and also joining us this evening, found in the same places as Tav, Goldson and Borna when they're defending. All at sea, it's Big Mark. Mark, how are we? Not bad at all, mate. How's yourself? All good? Ah, not too bad, mate. Not too bad. So let's get right into it. As I said, the phone lines will be open very shortly. So give us a call on 0141 628 7237 if you want to get anything off your chest. So let's start with the obvious from yesterday, uh, or sorry, Saturday, uh, and John Lundstrom. This is a guy who has flattered to deceive far too often in a Rangers jersey. He's had spells of obvious highs, but he's had far too many consistent lows in big games. Connor, would you agree with that? Uh, I think over a piece, uh, certainly this season, it's hard not to agree with it. Um, it as you say, flattered to deceive, really. I think he's he, he's had spells this season where he's stepped up a bit and you thought, oh, maybe he's starting to get back to, to the old John Lundstrom, um, you know, the, the Europa League. Lundstrom, um, who seems to be conspicuous by his absence in, in recent times. Um, but, you know, again, <clears throat> on Saturday, a, a big game, a season-defining game, um, and he lets everybody down. Um, you know, we'll obviously get into the nuts and bolts here, um, but reality is we get ourselves into a position where you're back in the game after he has given away a ridiculous own goal, um, and then he... Just absolutely a moment of madness, you'd have to say. Um, you know, I said last night briefly that it reminded me of Scott Wright's red card against Aberdeen earlier on in the season. Um, you know, where it was just that there was no rhyme or reason behind doing it. And it, you know, I'm not saying this is the case, but it was almost as if that did they want to get himself sent off because he, he can't make tackles like that. And I just, as I say, sadly for him, he's let uh, he's let the side down and. I, I find it hard. Um, I hate saying this um, because I have been a fan of his since he came into the club, but I find it hard to see how, how the Rangers fans are going to be able to forgive him for that. Mark, if we take John Lundstrom in isolation here, since he came into the midfield for his, his old firm record stands at two wins and 14 starts. Now, normally in these games, it's the midfield battle that you have to win. 
And we haven't won a title since he's come into the side. He was seen as the long-term replacement for Steve Davis, but it hasn't quite worked for us. What's your take on it? Yeah, I think that um, probably what Connor said, he's, he's, he's blown hot and cold for for probably his whole Rangers career. Um, we've seen we've seen glimpses of a, a, a really good player. We've seen absolute disasters, like, like we've seen at the weekend. Um, he, replacement for Davis, I think probably that's definitely a bridge bridge too far for for Lundstrom. I don't think he's got the he's got the quality for one um, to replace somebody like Davis. I think that still still really trying to figure out what it is what is his position as he as he a as a holding midfielder is he a one of these kind of quarterback um, midfielders that sit deep and, and and start start play and. Ping, ping, nice balls, diagonals, and um, I still don't know. I don't know whether he's box to box. Don't think he's got the legs for it, um, which is strange because I think at the start of the season he was the one. He was the fastest one. He won the he won the bleep test. He was a just baffles you. It really does baffle you. Um, he's he's starting to become a bit of an enigma, and I think probably, and I would hope probably that this is going to be his um, his last time you're going to see him. Uh, I think it will be. An absolute travesty if this man starts on uh, on a cup final day. I really do. I think that um, he's done what he could. I think I don't know whether he's he's tried too hard at some points, or I really don't know. It's very very hard to put your finger on what's went wrong, what's happened, and and what kind of player he is. Um, I'm slightly baffled by him. Um, for me, he's definitely no getting a getting a, um, a contract extension. I, I believe that he's, he's away to Turkey anyway, but just baffled, I think, is probably the over, overriding, my overriding thoughts on him. He's just a, a strange enigma of a player that that has got some sort of a quality and then goes and lets himself down terribly in probably what was the most important game of the season for probably a long, long time. So for me... Uh, it's a mentality thing. Um, you could probably argue that he tried to try to get himself sent off. Um, and the other one was the uh, and you're probably going to talk about it, but trying to blame somebody else for his for his own goal. I can't get my head around it. Um, just, uh, just as I said, I've got a call So we've got Chris and Falkirk on the line. Hi, Chris. What's your point this evening? Hi, good afternoon. Good, good, evening, good evening, gentlemen. I was just to say, I've seen a few people on social media, etc., and that call for Clement's head, and I think that would be grossly the wrong thing to do. Now, he's not won an old firm match of him yet, but I think we don't want to go down the route of sacking managers every six, seven months and end up like Watford to have a conveyor conve- belt of managers that they keep just sacking every six or seven months. Now, I'll do worry for Clement if we lose this cup final. Uh, due to what's happening just before the cup final with Walter's statue. I think that could just be the last straw for people if we were to lose that cup final. But I think there's a lot of dead wood there. You look at people like Cantwell, uh, Goldson, Barisic, Lundstrom, Scott Wright, the list could go on and on. I think it needs a good clear out. I think the manager's got to be given the time. He's got to be given the back for somewhere. And hopefully it could turn us because I just think Going down this manager journey again, looking for another manager. You look at the candidates we had. Lampard, still known a job. Muscat, he's that good. He can't get a job in Europe. Jensen's just been sacked out of uh, Alkmaar. McInnes, he turned the job down before. And uh, how good would he be at a club with an expectation of Rangers? I don't know. So a lot of the candidates that were in for before aren't exactly turned up trees either. So it just, it just makes you wonder... Just stick with Clement and give him the, uh, a couple of transfer windows and see what he could do from there. Connor, what's your take on Chris's point? Uh, I, listen, I think Chris is right. Look, um, I think it's always the case, you know, the raw emotion after after he was a big game. Um, clearly, too often we've had to experience that uh, throughout the season, particularly a game on Saturday in magnitude because it's, it's a title decider for all intents and purposes. Um you know, we had to win that game and then, you know, then you go on and do our business and potentially you're looking at a, a goal difference swing, if, if nothing else. Um, and, and so the emotions are there. But I think 
any talk of sacking the manager right now, just I don't think it'd be fair on him personally. Um, and I think he, he, you're in danger of a club are looking like you just don't know what you're doing because ultimately um, it's the board who make these decisions. Uh, a year ago, uh, you know, when we brought in Michael Beale, having sacked Van Bronckhorst under very similar circumstances um, throughout that season, um, <clears throat> we were all having this conversation about doing, um, you know, giving him the summer transfer window and stuff and see who he can bring in. That didn't work, obviously. He brought in the wrong players, but <clears throat> I still stand by that it's the right thing to do because you, you can't go in this merry-go-round of, of managers. You have to stick um, with somebody and you have to say, right, now is the time. Because if you look at it, right, one of the biggest problems we've got it has been that over the last six years, I think Celtic have had three permanent managers in that time um, where we've had, I think, at least four, possibly five. Um, that has to, you have to stop that and just make sure you're getting the right point around. I think Hamon is that man. I think he needs time to get his players in the door. He's been unlucky that one of the players he did sign in Cortez got injured as well. You can't legislate for that sort of stuff. just seems to be the luck we have. So I'd be sticking with him for now, but undoubtedly next week's a, a massive, a massive game for him because the only thing we can salvage for this season is, is winning a cup double. Um, and it's on him to finally get a result against him that matters because that's the important thing. We all get a result against them last year, but it didn't matter. A cup final always matters. I don't care what anybody says, oh, the league's done, they've already won the league and they won't care about it. Of course they'll care about it. It's a cup final against your rivals. It matters. That's a big game. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Chris is right. I would need to stick with come on and hope he can do the, the rebuild that we should have had done last year. Chris, I'm just going to come back to you. In Glasgow, though, you only stay around long enough if you manage to beat the other side. So if Clement doesn't win the cup final and then the first Old Firm game of next season is at Parkhead, is he under severe pressure if he doesn't win both of those? I, I think, see if he loses uh, both of those, I think we could be having a conversation round about October time looking for another new manager. And I just feel we just kind of continue on with that. Because what's going to happen is, if we bring a new manager in again in October, November, he's just going to inherit another truckload of players that several managers have uh, brought in. And I think that would be a huge... Also, I think with the midfield, the midfield hardly has any legs, hardly has any energy. That needs to be addressed. Now, you look at Celtic's midfield. Everybody's going about how much this rebuild's going to cost. Hatate, O'Reilly and McGregor cost £3 million between them. So it can be done. You can rebuild a midfield uh, for quite a, a sensible fee if you're smart in the market. Well, that's a point very well made, Chris Mark. What's your take on that? Do you think we have to shop smart come the summer? I think it's imperative that we do. I think that we have no other option to, to than to shop smart. I think that the budget that he's going to get is not going to be anywhere near what it should be. Um, and probably with outside investment, that's never, ever going to happen either. So I don't know where they're going to get the money from to do what I believe is a major, major overhaul in this squad. Um, there's too many, too many uh, people that have, we spoke about earlier, resorted to type. Um, for me, a big clear, I would get rid of a lot of the old guard I'd get rid of. To, to be fair, they'll probably be quicker telling you who I'd keep than, than who I would get rid of, because uh, it would be quicker, but for me, there's a massive overhaul required. Um, and we said that at the exact same, the exact same time last year. Um, um, so we're pretty much in the exact same position and, and we're so-called overhaul that we all really get excited about at the start of the season is uh, fell flat on its face and we're going to need to pull our socks up and do it again. You just hope that with Cop and and, uh, and, and Clement that we, we, we can uh, box a bit cleverer in the market. Chris, that's a terrific call to kick things off tonight. So thanks very much. Oh, Please give us a call. Have a nice day. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. If you want to be like Chris and get your point across, 0141 628 7237. And we'll bring up as much as your uh, super chats throughout this evening as we can. This one from Loch Ivanu. Good evening, lads. What an intro, Davey. Gerard got three years to build his title winning team. We need to be patient with Clement and the new signings when they come in and get behind the team. 
What's your take on that, Connor? Do you think that new signings are key, but is it as much outgoings as well as incomings because potentially to generate the funds for a rebuild? Is Jack Butland though the prime target for, for, for clubs that are willing to spend big money? I mean, yeah, he's certainly our most valuable saleable asset. There's no getting away from that. Um, I think Jack Butland alone easily can bring you 10, 15 million quid in the baller. Um, I think, obviously, in an ideal world, we'd all like to keep him um, in, in place um, because of how well he's been down for us. I mean, even against Celtic at the weekend, he saves a penalty, produces a couple of magnificent saves to keep us in it. Um, and I think you've got to say that it certainly bodes ominously if, if he is to go. But then we do have, weirdly, at, at this club, a very good tradition of bringing in good goalkeepers. We seem to have a knack for, for that area of the park. Um, but in terms of the wider point, look, Gerard did get three years, but it was different circumstances for Stephen Gerard than, than come on. I think people will understand that, that he, he took over at a time where we had obviously came back for, for the depths, as it were, and got back into the league. Um, the Kashina experiment massively failed, and I think it was understood that we a rookie manager like Stephen Gerrard as well. He, were, he was going to need to be given time, and I don't think there was an expectation on him coming in that well, he's going to win the league straight away. Problem is, now we have actually won a league title. We won a couple of years ago the league title, and we should have kicked on for it. We didn't. Now you're looking at come on and thinking, well, he's got to find a way of wrestling this title back next year or it's it's at risk of getting out of hand because they're already on three in a row. If you let them get to four in a row and then five and then, you know, somebody said in the comments, they could get to 56 before us. That's an embarrassment if that happens to us. And, and I know there are factors in terms of with titles we've not been in the league to win and, and coming back up, but take all that out of the equation at least one of the last three titles should have came to Ibrox and they haven't so you know he's not going to get three years but certainly he's going to get time to bring in his own players uh, and hopefully um, you know we'll, we'll get a few out the door and bring a few in and that's what it's going to have to be so 01416287237 is the number to call Chris in Dunfermline has called that number Chris what's your point this evening? How you doing David? No bad, Chris. How's yourself? Oh, no. I'm, I'm not surprised with yesterday how it's panned out because I believe I was on the phone line about three, about three weeks ago. And it was, Mar and, uh, it was Mark and Connor. And basically, when I came off the phone, they basically kind of dismissed what I was saying because I don't blame the manager. I don't blame the players. This is firmly at one place as a board and John Bennett, because when I came off the call about three weeks ago, Kenny Connor, then when I came off, Connor says, the budget between Rangers and Lost County. But I was actually talking about the budget of Lost County. I was talking about the budget against us and them, because at the end of the day, they're going for four in a row. And I did say in the summer, I did say when I was on the call three weeks ago in the summer, our budget was pathetic, what we spent on players. And if you actually look at our back four, if you actually look at well, how many of their players in the back four is probably equal to Vickers. And then if you look at our midfield, on Saturday, it was non-existent. Why was it non-existent? Because you're looking at lunchtime, who we got in a free. And if you look at Tarte, um, Riley and McGregor, we've got no midfielder who's even close to that quarry. And I can believe Martin asked Scott a few weeks ago how to resource it. Simple. Mathematics. You put some money into it. You put funds into it. You get better players. How you get better players? By splashing the cash. Well, Chris, I'm going to take your point to Mark, but Mark, is it not just the fact that spending money, because last summer we did spend money, it's about spending that money wisely, and I think Michael Beale was entrusted with the largest budget we've ever had since we've been back in the top flight, 
and he blew it on players that just aren't of the calibre for Rangers. I think you're right. I think you're 100% right. I, I think that the, well, our whole strategy needs to change. I think that what we've tried to do is we, we've tried to buy players that have went for more money than what they were going for. In other words, they'd, they'd come up to a point, maybe say for talking sake, like Lammers, I think Lammers went for six and a half million at one point. And he's he's no exactly set to Heather light, but we know that he's came for a decent pedigree and he had potential before he signed there. We're trying to nick him for two and a half, three million, three and a half million, and trying to trying to get the best out of him. I think that, that the days of that, I think we've done that all last summer. I think probably the majority of our signings was what we tried to do. I think that the strategy needs to change. I think that your your Diamandes and your Cortezes, i.e. Brian Young players that have got potential, that, that are, are well thought of, that are in a upward trajectory and trying to get them in the ground level, when you can get them for maybe three million, three and a half million, hoping to uh, nurture them, bring them on and, and kind of get them sold on for 10 plus million and stuff like that. I think that's got to be the way we go. Um, looking like the players that we're kind of getting linked with and, and, and looking at the players that we brought in, i.e. Cortez and Diamandi, both are between that 20 and 25 age group, that age bracket. Both are from not exactly obscure leagues, but leagues that are not exactly um, top five. And, and we're trying to take them, nurture them, make them better and, and try and make money that way. And I think that that's the only way we're going to go. But the problem is that us as Rangers fans, are we going to, are we going to uh, live with that? Are we going to be able to uh, know have a, a big name, know have somebody that's, we want we all want to finish the article rather than bringing players in that might might need a year to to kind of uh, get up to speed with it with the game Scottish game and trying to nurture the best out of them. So it's it's a balancing act, but I I think that we we need to try and get our get our mind off that. Um, we're trying to buy the buy the uh, the finished article. I think that that's the way we're going to be going in future. And listen. A young, talented squad is something that probably we've all been shouting about for years. We've talked about bringing youth through. We'd all love to see homegrown coming through and stuff like that. And for me, that's that's the only way you're going to go. We've tried over the last God knows how many years to try and buy in success. And it doesn't work unless you start hitting that. As you talked about Carter Vickers, would they pay $9.5 million for the boy? So we're not going to go and pay $9.5 million for a cent and a half. So we're never, ever going to get a cent and a half that's as good as that. If we don't bring them in cheap, young, and nurture them, that's the only way that's going to happen because we're not going to find them. Mark, 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 David. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at their back four, last summer they spent eight million on two centre halves. We spent nothing. It's, if you're not willing to put your money where your mouth is, like I said, they spent eight million on two centre halves. And they got on to, that's what I, I say to Martin. And Mark, a few weeks ago, if they don't put the money where the mouth is, you're looking at eight or nine years of domination. Because that's what's going to happen. Because well, Chris, can, can I ask you, you something? You have... Chris, yeah, what... on you go. is there anybody that you want us to spend that money on? Do you have a player in mind? Not a player in mind, but... If you look at it, if you look at the two, they spent a million on centre halves. We spent a pathetic, I repeat, a pathetic five million in the summer. I came and spent overall fifteen million, but we got twelve million of that back. And like I said, Connor a few weeks ago after Ross County says, because I I've fairly <clears throat> said I don't blame the manager or the players. And then he was comparing Rangers to Ross County budget. But I was saying, I just don't think he might grasp it because Matt exactly know where I was coming from. But Conrad, I don't think... I'm not comparing the budget to us against Ross County. I'm comparing our budget to them. And they've spent more money. They've spent 40 million in the last two years. They've gone for four in a row. The last 12 years, they've won love and tails to our one. It's, it's plain and simple. If the board do not put the money where the mouth is, they, they've, got, they've already got a tarty Riley. 
McGregor, do you think they're going to weaken this team in the summer? Do they think they're, they're not going to get better than what they've already got? So if we don't match what they've already got now, I'm not saying what, saying what they're going to spend in the summer. If we don't even match what they're going to spend in now, you're looking at nine years of domination. I commend you, Will. Um, a wee while goes. If we're not capable, we're going to be the SPL of of Scotland. That's exactly where Rangers are at this precise moment. We're second best in every department. But I say, you look at last, you look at the back four. No, I th- I think we've lost Chris there. Um, but that he made some very you know. Thought provoking points, shall we say, Connor? I mean, what is your take? I mean, I brought up the point earlier that John Bennett has been conspicuous by his absence since he made the comment, you know, a few months after we were in the Europa League final. He said we had assembled the greatest Rangers squad that's ever been built. And that comment has fell flat since because we haven't won a league title since then. And the trophies that we have won have been sparse. Where is John Bennett? You know, in times gone by, we've had chairmen who have always been at the forefront and certainly have been vocal. Dave King, you know, to a lesser extent, you know, the, the, the innocuous Charles Green and before that, David Murray. What What is happening uh, with John Bennett? Why is he sort of, you know, hiding in the wilderness for a better phrase? So, firstly, let me just... Say a couple of things straight there. Um, because <clears throat> clearly there's been a few things uh, leveled at me for Chris, and that, listen, that's fair enough. Um, possibly just a slight correction because he said that Carter Vickers cost nine million, it didn't cost six million. Just just to clarify that, it was six million. Yeah, um, that was me that said that. I, I think that was me that said that, buddy. My well, apologies, I thought it was Chris, but um, it was six million. But anyway, the point still remains. I mean, it's still a good piece of business. Um, I remember. What Chris was talking about with that call, right? We had just lost to Ross County, and he was talking about finances and that being part of the reason for why we were losing games like that and we had lost the league. And the point I made at the time is that you can't use finances as an excuse for losing to Ross County in a one to one game like that because they've spent next to nothing comparatively to us. I was not saying that finance isn't a factor when you look at the head to head between us and Celtic and obviously competing for. The league title because obviously to compete for the league title your main competitors are Celtic and you have to try and keep up with that. We did spend money in the summer last year. Michael Beal got given money to spend. He got backed and he brought in players that weren't good enough. Now he might say well Dessers has got 21 goals for the season you know so that that proves he was right. It doesn't because if he was anywhere near the level he should be at, he'd have had at least 30 goals because the amount of chances he's missed. However, I'm not demeaning the fact he's got 20 goals. It's We'd be in a worse position without them. Um, but yeah, part of it is also, you've got to, it's one part of it is obviously European money and stuff like that. Right? You win the league title and you qualify for Europe, that brings in a pot of money. The other part is a player trading model. And we've been talking for years our board level as well have been saying about how we need to go down this player trading model. We need to get players in the door and get them out for good money. We've not done it. Well, they have. You look at uh, three players just off the top of my head in the last couple of years um, for them that they've got big money for and I'll, I'll still get big money on the back of because they sell on fees. Kieran Tierney, £25 million. Hudson Edwards, £16 million. Quid. Jeremy Frimpong, who looks like he's going to be sold to Leverkusen for about £50 million, quid, which means a massive pot of money for them in terms of the selling, because he went, um, I believe it was something like 11 or 12 million pounds. We are no selling players often enough for that value. The last player we sold for anywhere near that's Nathan Patterson, we sold for 12 million quid. That's what you've got to do as well. You've got to generate your own revenue by doing that, and we haven't been good enough at that. So absolutely, the board have got questions that need to be answered. Um, and in the summer, we're going to have to try and get as much money as we can for certain players in order to beef up the pot. Um, but look, you know, Again, these are the things that the, your board have to answer. And unfortunately, those are the areas where Celtic have been leaps and bounds ahead of us because they've been doing that. We've been letting players go for nothing because we're running out of contract. Well, Connor, I'm going to bring in a, a voice of reason. Uh, loyal rabble caller Jim and Kirky is waiting on the line. Jim, how are we? 
I'm fine, boys. Um, I'm, I'm all right. Just uh, my call, just listening to what the guys are saying, talking a lot of sense as usual. Um, absolutely disgusted uh, with the performance on Saturday. But I just want to question, I know it's been, to see the actual line-up, uh, the selection was ridiculous. I don't understand, as I say, though, Yilmaz, how he's no starting, right? And anybody that knows anything about football, we're doing to the bones of our ass, right? You've got to, we're talking about the, the guys are talking there about the Celtic midfield, and rightly so, the last caller was spot on, or the callers have been spot on. So what do you do with that? You try and nullify that. So anybody that knows anything about football, you put Sterling in the middle of the park. You put him in the middle of the park and you play Young McCausland outside right. Quite simple. I'm not saying they won the game of that, but you've got to give yourself a fine chance. And then centre half. He goes to centre half in the second half. How's Young, we're talking about Young players, corner again, spot on. How's Leon King no getting a, how's he not coming on and play at centre half? What's the point of being on the bench? What's the point of Yilmaz being on the bench if they can't start the game, if they can't play when they're needed? Now, and then my next one is John Lundstrom. As I was on the show, I've been on consistently talking about these guys and James Tavernier. Hopeless. Now, there's a, I mean, through, with John Lundstrom, there seems to be an element in the Rangers support who thinks when he plays two or three good games, he should get another two-year contract or something. Now, it's your job to play well. You're playing for the best club in the world. Do your job properly. It's hopeless. His attitude, I think it was Big Market, say that. See, when he put the finger up with that OG, honestly, I was I was lucky. I was not buying my third television for this year because that was a disgrace. Uh, everything about them was a disgrace. So, moving on and being positive, we've still won the League Cup. We won with the Europa League section. We were, I would still say, and I'm going to be, and maybe I'll get slaughtered for it, maybe a couple injuries away for beating them. And I'm not just talking about the game, sorry guys, at the weekend, I'm talking about the game at Ibrox as well. Oh, I think Jim's just lost connection there. Hopefully we can get him back. But Mark, I think he was making, as always, uh, uh, Jim does, uh, some very valid points in regards to, you know, the weekend and Rangers in general. But the lineup, let's start with that. Did the manager get the selection wrong for you? Because I take it back to the, the Ibrox fixture where he played the same three midfielders in the middle of the park in Lundstrom, Diamandi and Lawrence. And we were overran for the first 45 minutes and we were 2-0 down. And, you know, you fast forward to Saturday, we were 2-0 down again. Was the lineup a concern for you? It was. Um, my my biggest thing, and it, and it kind of boils my piss a wee bit, that see if they're fit enough to play, uh, sorry, if they're fit enough to be on the bench, they're fit enough to play, as far as I'm concerned. No, whether it be they're only good for a half, start them. See if they're the better better man in that position. Start them and take them off at half time. Try and win the game by half time. Try and do do a bit of damage before half time. Don't try and consolidate and then try and bring them on to try once the game's away face. Um for me, I would have started Yelmas. Um Lundstrom on form, would never have started. Uh, I think Raskin's had a wee bit of a bum deal, although, in all fairness, he's not really performed this season at all. So, but I think that when when your centre mid, or your, your so-called main centre mid, is having a howler, you need to take him out of the firing line, and you need to try something different. Um, I understand that he's maybe went, do you know what, I'll maybe stick him in there, and, and he maybe does a turn this game. It may be up his game for because it's against Celtic. But for me, see if you're no good enough, you're no playing, you're not playing at a correct standard, then you're out of the team until you show me in training. And then if you get 15 minutes or 20 minutes when you come on, you show me that you're, you're good enough. If you perform, then you will get that shot. And for me, it should never ever have started. Um, whether you took Sterling um, and put Sterling at, at the centre mid slot and, and never played Lundstrom or Raskin, it's probably another. It's another argument, and um, for me as well, I think that we're with that threadbare for wiggers and stuff like that. I think about a, a bit of running power and a bit of pace is why you put him in the in, in right hand side. He's done a job for us there, so I think he was trying to kind of almost patchwork a team together. Um, but for me, I looked at that. I looked at that and I the lineup, and I thought we're not winning this today, uh, and and it's sad. And don't get me wrong as well. 
a lot of that's to do with the fact that you're, you're struggling for creativity and uh, uh, wingers struggling for wingers struggling for creativity so it just is for me it was just a shit show for start to start to finish and i think it was always going to be that when you looked at it when you looked at the team selection just to let everyone know, we do apologise. Our producers just informed us that the phone lines are down again, so we do apologise for that. But we will continue, so please stay with us. Uh, Connor, Mark made some very valid points there. But another point that Jim and Kirky made that I wanted to touch on was that of James Tavernier. Now, this always comes up. This is his ninth season now, or going into his ninth year at the club. In terms of his old firm record, in particular, he's got a 62% loss rate in this fixture. He's played 37, he's won nine, drawn five, and lost 23. Now, I grew up watching Rangers in the 9 row era, and I've seen, seen us nothing but win trophies back to back. I was spoiled growing up. But the Celtic captain at that time was a guy called Paul McStay. Nice guy, decent enough football player, but won very little as captain. And the minute they made that change, that was the changing of the guard for them. And then they saw a bit of success after that. Do we have to cut all ties in respect with James Tavernier and his tenure as Rangers captain? Because for me, it's shrouded in failure and that cannot continue. We talk about a leadership group, but I grew up again watching a team that any Rangers player in that team could have been captain. You could have mm. Gorham, you could have Loudrop, you could have Goff, you could have McCoy, you could have Bomber Brown. All these guys were fit to wear the armband. Ian Ferguson, Ian Durant. They talk about this leadership group, but I don't see a leader in amongst any of them. And that, for me, is the biggest concern going forward. What's your take on it? Well, that's that's the problem, isn't it? You know, we, we talk about Tav a lot, Um you know, he comes in for a lot of flack. You'd expect that as Rangers captain, you know, you carry the can for a lot of things. It's part of that role. Um, some players, as we've seen over the years, um, you know, the, the guys you mentioned, guys like Barry Ferguson um, as well, you know, they, they relished um, being in that position and the pressures that, that came with that. Tav, you know, I think um, the, he said moments. You can see when he's relished it. I think it's an undeniable that, he certainly um, provided some big moments for us in terms of he's, he's scored some big goals. You can't, you can't forget that. He's a, a Europa League golden boot winner as a right back for Rangers. Um, you know, two years ago, that that's unheard of. Um, Rangers strikers don't even get Europa League golden boots uh, unless you're Ali McCoist. Um, you know, and yet he's done that. So that's the positive sides of James Tavernier and what he can bring. The issue is that time and again, that mentality side of things when it comes to those big crunch games against Celtic. And, and look, you, you can't label every one of those 23 defeats at, at his door solely and say that's all his fault because he's also, I think, more than any other Rangers captain, had to deal with a lot of turmoil, a lot of changeover in managers and different players coming in the door. You know, he's had to deal with situations with the likes of Pedro Cachina, which, you know, doesn't matter who your captain is when, when you've got a manager like that in charge who's just clueless and then you've got the, the muddy situation and he, so he's had things that have been out of his control that have gone against him as well but when you're a captain you you have to be the one sometimes that does st step up instead of the ship I mean look, we might not see like saying it uh, as Rangers fans but Scott Brown did that for Celtic for best part of a decade um, and his time there is trophy leading uh, now, yes, again, I'm sure some people would say, well, he had the fortune that Rangers going down or that. There was that, but there was still, adver you know, um, there was still adversity in his time at Celtic that he came out, came out of as well. And Tav just doesn't seem to do that often enough. But you touched on it. If you were to take the armband off James Tavernier tomorrow, who's the ready-made captain to step into the bridge? Because it's no John Lindstrom. No after what he done. Um... Ryan Jack's probably on his way out the door. Do you give it to Jack Butland, your goalkeeper? Um, it's an unusual thing to do. Um, no many goalkeepers that are captains, so it's where you give that armband to. Uh, I also think as well, if you bring in players in the summer, it's a bit unfair to, to just land that at one of their doors. I know I, I, last week, I think it was somebody spoke about Paddy McNair. 
as he's been linked. Um, he's a guy who's a captain of Northern Ireland, um, so he's got experience there. But we don't right now. We don't have that leader out way to have at the club. But I do agree. I think a change in the guard, probably at some point in the next year, is is needed. You need to hit that reset button and and go again. Celtic done that. You know, you look at the season we won the league and things fell apart. The writing was in the wall. Scott Brown knew, Celtic knew, his time was up. Um, but they had the luxury that we don't have. They had a Callum McGregor sitting there, ready, willing and able to take that armband. We don't have that. And that's the concern. That's why Tav is still going to be your captain for at least the next season. Mark, what's your take on it? You said earlier on in the podcast this evening that there was a, it was easier for you to name the players that you wanted to get ready rather than the folk that you thought were going to stay. So does James Tavernier come under that for you? I mean, I know as Connors argued the fact that his goal contributions always count, but I've got a take on this. I think the fact that Tav takes the penalties allows our attacking players to hide. There's nobody that's allowed to step up to the mantle because he's going to always hit every free kick that's within range or every penalty. Does changing him from being the captain allow other players to step up? Which What's your thoughts? You no, know, I, t- I take that point. I take that point on board, yeah. I think that that's maybe a, maybe a shout as well. Um, I think that there's probably other other players in, in the group that can hit free kicks, can hit... Uh, Corners can hit pens. Um, the problem is he's been doing it and he's been scoring them, so that's why he's, he stayed where he stayed. Um, as I said about getting short of players and stuff like that, for me, what I would do with Tavernier is I think that I think that it's a bit of a slap in the face if you take the t- captaincy off him in, in one full swoop. I think that I think probably the season that um, the. Uh, this season probably going to be his, 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 I would say his last. His legs are starting to go, but he's been a great servant to the club. So what you do for me is, and what happens at other clubs, is you keep him as captain, but you don't play him as much. I.e., you bring somebody in a replacement. I.e., an understudy. You you make somebody else a captain. I.e., a, a vice captain that that is generally the captain. And what you do is when when Tav comes on as a sub, you give him a captain's armband for the last 15, 20 minutes or whatever. Use him sparingly. Use them for that kind of if you need you need a bit of attack and threat or stuff like that because for me he's not got the legs to get him down the park for a full ninety minutes anymore. So rather than slap him in the face and take it off him, I think that it deserves a wee bit better than that because because of the service that he's gave to us. Whether you like him, whether you love him, whether you hate him, it doesn't really matter. The boys scored a phenomenal amount of goals for us. He's pulled us out of shit many 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 times. So for me, it's no it's it's no something that I would have done. Uh, you don't, you don't, uh, a servant like that, you don't slap him in the face by stripping him a captaincy in, in the twilight of his career. Uh, for me, that's just no done. That's no, that's no the Rangers' way as far as I'm concerned. So what you do is you, 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 you ease him out. We've done it with um, Henderson, didn't they, at Liverpool as well. You ease him out. You bring in talent, young talent that that might might need a break every now and again. So you, you maybe plays one game in three, one game in four. You bring him on bits and bobs like that and, and you kind of try and blood a new right back or even Sterling there's no reason why we can't play Sterling because uh, he's, a, he's a strange one for you Sterling's a right side uh, a, a, a right back by trade that is his trade so why are we not using him as a right back I think it'd be a smashing right back if Tav wasn't there I think he's ideal he's powerful he's pacey gets forward um, I, I, and he can defend better than, than, than Tavernier so for me you don't slap him in the face. I don't. I don't think that's right. Although I don't, it wouldn't be getting in my team week in week out. I think that it's time we try and phase him out. Goldson would go. Um, Davies would go. To be fair, I, I'm I'm probably that away for Suter going as well. Barisic is away. I'd get shot at him. Lundstrom would go. Um, obviously, Jack's away. McLaughlin's away. I mean, there's all sorts of get shot. I mean, I would get shot. I would sell, sell McCausland. I don't think McCausland's McCausland should have kicked on, and I think that that was this was the season to kick on. No, he's only going to be a bit part player. He's going to come on for fifteen minutes in games if he's here next season. Um, right, shot him. I mean, like I said, you'd be quite saying the ones I'd keep. The ones I'd probably keep Yelmaz, 
Uh, Dio Mandy, even Cantwell. I think probably Cantwell's run his race with. Lawrence as well, I'd get shot at him or not. I really would. If you can get money from these players and you bring other players in, get shot. I'd keep Big Dessers. Big Dessers would be my second striker or my third striker. Um, I'd bring in another two strikers. I mean, you're struggling there. Who, who else are you going to keep, really, realistically? Butlin. Butlin probably going to get sold because we need money. Because it doesn't grow in trees. People are shouting about we need to spend money on this and that. Where's this money coming from? So, as it's back to the original, swing back right around to the original question. For me, Tavernier would stay as captain. He'd be playing a bit plat player, would select A, a captain, i.e. vice captain, but it really would be our captain and would take it from there. I don't see a problem with Butlin. Butlin's vocal, um, leads by example, um, model professional. I don't see a problem with Butlin. For me, Butlin, as it stands at the minute, if you look at that squad, probably Butlin's the only one that you would give it to, realistically. No, that's a point that I don't think many people would argue with, Mark. Uh, a big thanks to Andrew Lamb for his super chat. He didn't leave a comment, but a big thanks to Andrew for that. So, Connor, I wanted to touch on the manager's presser today because, for me, he said a few alarming things, and I don't think we're going to get through them all. And I think it's sort of been the way of his press conferences recently, and he's talking about things like XG and points one and how progress is, you know, the fact that we only lost 2-1 at Parkhead this year and we didn't get beat 3-4 and four now. I thought they were very alarming comments for a Rangers manager, but possibly the most alarming thing that he did say today is we've got 11 players out for Dundee tomorrow. So how do you compre comprehend that? I mean, for me, our injuries the last three or four seasons have been ridiculous and it was much heralded that we brought back Doc Waller to the club because it was seen when he moved away, that's when it started to go wrong. But it's not really improved. And for me, Clement was saying that he's going to make changes in certain departments. He wish he could tell the press right now, but he's going to keep it in-house. Is that aimed at the doctor or is it the fitness coaches, the physio? Who do you think that was aimed at today? Hey. A... Probably all of the above. Um, I mean, look, you could bring in Doc Martin. It doesn't seem to matter um, where our players are concerned right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, the injury list is ever growing. Um, has been for a while. I think. I think part of it has to be, you know, you have to look at a number of factors, right? Because there's no way in the, on earth that when these players were signed, that they all had records of of being injured constantly. Because you wouldn't sign that many players if they're all injury prone. Undoubtedly, a few of them did have. I mean, Kemal Roof is a classic example. He's somebody who, if we're all being brutally honest, would never be at Rangers if he didn't have the injury record that he's that he's got because he is a great football player. He's a great striker. Um, his time at Leeds was blighted by injury after injury after injury, and that's what caused him the, the opportunity to perhaps play his trade at a higher level down south. Um, and, he, and he's came to us, and we've done that with others. So you've got to examine that. It's also, what are we doing in the training ground? Is it that the the training sessions are too intense for certain players? Do you need to tailor fit it for certain players uh, at certain degrees? How are you doing the warm-ups? I know that when Phil came in, he was talking about getting a hold of the medical records for all the players and examining it and going through all this stuff. And he was talking about bringing back things like the ice baths and getting them used properly and all that sort of thing, uh, to try and relax the muscles. I don't know if that's been happening or not. Maybe he feels that isn't happening, and maybe that's what he's he's hinting at there. Maybe he's saying his physio's only, only up to the mark and, and the doctor isn't doing the things he needs him to do. Uh, that being said, though, um, you know, I, I can't see how... I can't see how you would bring in this new approach, this new attitude, and bring in these people... Um, and think that in six months it's all going to change. It takes longer than that, you know, with players. And there's some players that is it a psychological thing because I, I feel as if there are certain players that if they have the slightest wee niggle, won't play. And for me, that's not a good thing at all because, you know, I'm not suggesting players should play when they're hurt. But if you've got just a tiny wee niggle, you back camp or whatever, if you're 80, 90% fit, there's no reason why you still can't take part um, and give an hour or whatever and then come off um, if you're needed and you're required. So 
There's definitely that. Um, of course, what doesn't help Phil is that uh, nobody seems to understand what's happening with you know, the the Cantwell situation either, because he seems to, you know, blow hot and cold with him as well. And I wonder if that harms players when they're, they're in and then they're out and then they're in and then it's chop and change. And you know, you have to have stability there. So, um, well, clearly, when we have this clear out, a lot of the injury prone players will go. Hopefully, the the backroom staff, the physios will will be better um, going forward and we'll, and we'll do that. With injuries is a part of football. You're not going to get a season where you don't get any injuries, but certainly you can limit the impact to them and the amount that you get. And I think that's the important part for us to make sure. Make sure as well in the summer when you're bringing in players, don't bring in players that are injury prone. I mean, I say I feel sorry for young Cortes. He, he's one that you just, you can't, you absolutely cannot legislate for that. Um, but then that's another question I'm, I'm maybe throw it back to you is, that might be an element of when you're bringing in these lads for the continent in particular, do they understand before they come here the physicality levels in the Scottish game? Are they ready for that when they're thrown straight in for the continent? Well, I don't think Oscar Cortez had seen a plastic pitch before in his life before he came to Rugby Park, and obviously that's where he picked up his injury. And just touching on that then, Mark, we our current record with injuries at the moment, he was a player that we all liked. And I know we've got an option to buy, not an obligation to buy. But the fact that this was such a serious injury, would that make you turn your attentions elsewhere because of the fact we've had so many in, injury problems on the recent seasons? I think yes and no. Uh, I think that I've seen, a, I've seen enough of him to think that it, it would have been a success here. I think you what we spoke about earlier, you need to be clever, you need to box clever in this market. And I think what you do is you go back to them and say, look, we will give you a fee to keep him for another season on loan uh, with an option to buy because of this injury. I think that's what you do. I think that's a clever thing to do. Um, if they come back and say, no, that's not a case, you either buy him or, you, or you're not getting him, then I would just say, do you know what? No, thanks. I don't think we are anywhere near where we we can we can take a, a, a kind of three and a half million pound gamble in this young boy. It looked apart and same exact same thing as what happens um the the whole season over. Because he's not played for us, we've seen him play and it gets better. The longer he's out, it gets better. And we go, oh, Cortez. Before the whole firm game we're talking about, oh we're gonna miss Cortez, we're gonna miss Cortez. Played three but three games, four games for us. And we're talking about we're missing him. That's madness. So I, I think that that whole Rangers thing where the longer he stays out and, and then when they leave us as well, when they go, oh, he was a great player. Well, we need to bring him back. We need to get our head around this. this we need to be, we need to, somebody said in a, in a, we need to be more ruthless. I, I agree with that to a certain extent, but we can't be taking three and a half million gambles on this young boy after seeing three, four, three, four games. Different if you can get him in, back in and loan for another year or even six months. To say you get six months, he's he's back, he's fit. See how his injury goes, because I mean, look at it. But Hadji's never been the same player since he got back for that injury. So you think about that. If we we sim, if it is a similar injury, I'm not sure if it came out exactly what the injury was. But if it's a similar type of injury, it might never be the same player again. So why are we going to fling money at him because because he had four good games for us and scored a goal? We need to be clever. We need to box clever. So for me, that you say right, we'll take him on loan. Another season with an obligation or an option to buy, and uh, if they say no, I'll just say right, we'll, we'll walk away for the deal. Simple as that. We'll look elsewhere. We can't. We can't be keeping bringing in injured players and players that we don't know and take gambles on. We can't be doing it anymore. I know. I think you make a terrific point there, Mark Connor. If we can turn our t- attention towards tomorrow night's fixture, and then obviously our trip to Tynecastle, we do have an abundance of injuries. But what do we do? Do we try and prepare a formation for the cup final and just put the players that we've got available in that formation just now so the team are regimented before it? Or do we just try and fill a team as best as we can for tomorrow? Obviously, we need to win tomorrow to still technically prevent them from winning the championship tomorrow. So what's your thinking? Do guys like Raskin come back into the fold? We can't well post in on social media and then not being included and then not being used as a substitute. Does he come back in or is him and Clermont finish for you? 
what would you do tomorrow? Well, it's a tricky one because obviously, like you say, um, listen, the, the league is gone. There's no, there's no denying that. But certainly, um, you know, you don't want them mathematically getting over the line because we've no done no jokes. Um, you know, that happened with us a couple of seasons ago when they went up to Tanadice and Drew and that one as the league. Um, so we need to make sure, above all else, get the three points tomorrow. Um, and then, you know, if they're going to win the league on Wednesday night, um, then so be it. They're going to have to get out and actually win that game to do that. Um, so I think you put out what, the strongest eleven you can um, tomorrow. If he's got... I say if because I'm not sure if he will or not, but if he's got a formation in his mind or a tactic in his mind that he's thinking of using uh, getting into the cup final then by all means, give it a try if, if he thinks it can work tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure what that would be, right enough. Um, I think one of the things we, we will get to see um, that could be a positive, um, obviously, with the amount of injuries we've got is an issue, but with, with John Lundstrom being suspended, of course, I think we'll get to see uh, Raskin uh, probably start no more. Um, I would imagine I'll certainly get a lot more game time if he doesn't start. He might start Lawrence and then bring Raskin on, but um, that'll give him an opportunity to show um, you know what, what he's got and maybe make a case because I think you know for most of us sitting here, I don't think any of us want to see John Lundstrom back on a Rangers team sheet ever again. Um, but that only happens ultimately if a the players that can fill that position can stay fit and be that they're shown that they can perform in the next two games. Um, so that that's that's where we're going to have to be at. Um, look, that's all you can do now. I think if we can win those two games left in the league and then just get that out of the way and focus on on the big game, um, you know, a week from from Sunday and hope hope among hope that you can at least end the season on that high of winning the cup. But I appreciate the league's the most important thing. Um, and you would swap two cup, a league cup and a Scottish Cup for the league title every day of the week. But it's not often you find yourself in this situation where you've pretty much blown the league, but you've got an opportunity against your big rivals to still clinch a piece of silverware and, and, and go home with two trophies for the season, which if we're, if we're all being honest with how we've been this season, in and of itself would be slightly daylight robbery for us to win two trophies this year but <clears throat> that's all we can do and then it's your building block for the future um, it's, it's as simple as that really Well just before we go this evening I'll get a quick prediction from the two guys Mark I'll come to you first Rangers against Dundee at Ibrox tomorrow night how are you calling it? 2-0 um, Rangers Dessa first scorer and Connor, you get any better than that? Three one Rangers and a uh, Fabio Silva for score up just a bit different because it'll probably be Dessers, but I might as well say something else. <laughs> well, my thanks to Connor and Mark for joining me on the podcast this evening. My thanks to everybody in the comments. Please like, share, subscribe, subscribe rather. <laughs> Tell all your friends about us. I think I just swallowed my teeth towards the end of the podcast. And join uh, Martin and the guys tomorrow for a uh, post-match reaction. Uh, but due to the, the kickoff and that and the guys working this week, there will no, be no pre-match. So join us for the post-match reaction tomorrow. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night. Podcast Network.